You have all studied the deadlock of trench warfare in World War I. You have also learned that there are three major categories of solutions to the deadlock. The technical, tactical, and strategic. I would like to focus on one problem and then talk about one technical solution to it. The problem at hand is the problem of trench assault. After you have managed to survive your trip across no man's land and you get near an enemy trench, how do you rid that trench of all the anti-social people who are in it? By the time you get to the enemy's trench, he may well outnumber you, and you and he are both armed with bolt-action magazine rifles and the bayonet. Cleaning out a trench with a bayonet, though it can certainly be successful, is a relatively high-risk operation that consumes a great deal of manpower. Many armies experimented with new weapons which might help their soldiers do this job. In order to illustrate this point, we have prepared a target array which will give you some idea of what a soldier jumping into an enemy trench might have had to confront. The target array will consist of three stationary silhouette targets to the left, three more stationary silhouette targets to the right, and, after those are engaged, a surprise pop-up silhouette target that would roughly approximate an enemy soldier running out of a bunker or communications trench. As we engage this target array with various weapons, you should look at the advantages and disadvantages of each weapon going through the same target run. The first weapon will be the bolt-action rifle with the bayonet. The obvious problem with the bolt-action rifle is the long period of time between shots. The relatively small magazine capacity when you are dealing with an abundance of targets and the requirement to go in with the bayonet. One of the American solutions was the riot or trench shotgun. This Model 97 trench shotgun is a good example of many of the weapons that were tried. Though it has a bayonet lug, it normally was not used with the bayonet. It fires a 12-gauge shotgun shell, which is loaded with buckshot. Depending on the size of the buckshot, it may hold anywhere from 9 to 24 pellets per shell. The weapon was a pump action, which means it was cycled by pulling the slide back and then pushing it forward. This motion extracted and ejected the empty cartridge in the chamber, fed a new round up from the magazine, locked it into the chamber, and cocked the weapon. The shooter then only had to pull the trigger. Due to the shortage of spare parts for this 1897 riot gun, a new Model 500 riot gun will be used. The shells each hold 13 number O buckshot. One of the major problems with the shotgun is quite obvious. 
Its tubular magazine holds only six rounds, and in order to reload it, the rounds must be individually inserted by the shooter. There is no magazine charging. When out of ammunition, it takes a long time to reload and the shooter is vulnerable. The weapon appears to be very, very fast. The shooter killed his six stationary targets in well under three seconds. However, that can normally not be done in the hands of the ill-trained soldier. It took constant, repetitive training in order to achieve that sort of speed with a shotgun. Further, contrary to popular belief, you do not simply point a shotgun at the mass of the enemy and let fly. You select individual targets, aim at them, and kill them. The purpose of the buckshot is to give some margin for error. The pattern need not be perfectly centered on the chest. Secondly, buckshot kills by the sum total of the multiple wounds. The shooter using this shotgun has been using pump action shotguns for 24 years to include using them in both competition and combat. The average fellow with a shotgun would probably not acquit himself that well. Lastly, the remaining grave defect of the shotgun was not evident. The shotgun's maximum range with buckshot is only 50 yards. Though this is adequate for cleaning out a trench or for use at night, it leaves the shotgun armed soldier at a desperate disadvantage when he is caught in the open during daylight. The Germans tackled the technical problem from a completely new angle. They created a new class of weapons with a new set of advantages and disadvantages. In order to gain long combat range with good terminal effect, a strong weapon, the bolt action, firing a powerful cartridge was needed. The Germans decided to sacrifice long combat range. They took a pistol cartridge, the 9mm Luger, with vastly decreased range and energy, and chambered this into a shoulder-fired weapon. With the much reduced power of the ammunition, that shoulder-fired weapon could now be made fully automatic, and yet the soldier could still easily withstand the recoil and control the weapon. The result was the MP-18 submachine gun. You can see that the shooter of the submachine gun tackled his targets in only five seconds and still had ammunition for an eighth surprise target. He then easily reloaded his submachine gun with another magazine. You'll also note that the shooter engaged his targets with the proper short burst technique. He aimed at each individual target, gave it a burst, and then moved to the next. The submachine gun kills by firing a group on the target, much like the shotgun fires a pattern of buckshot. This group gives the shooter some margin for error and still assures adequate target hits. Contrary to what Hollywood would have you believe, the continuous spray is simply not effective with any weapon short of a water-cooled machine gun. As an example here, let us suppose that our submachine gun shooter was faced with six targets at double arm interval. This would give him a linear target width of 30 feet. He only has 32 rounds in the magazine, so he would have to have his sweeping motion perfectly in tune with the cyclic rate of fire of the weapon, and I suppose with the Zen harmony of the universe, in order to evenly space his bullets along that linear target. Hopefully, the spacing and the harmony would be such that a bullet would land on the breastbone of each of the six targets. Give me a break. The submachine gun is also important as an example of a design trade-off. It was a conscious attempt by the designers to satisfy a problem 
with the weapon that gives up advantage in one of the components of firepower in order to gain advantage in another component. On the chart, it looks something like this. Note the bolt action, which you have seen before, is our baseline weapon with a volume of fire of 14 rounds per minute and battle sight and adjust sight range going out to 1,000 yards. Remember that at close range, where the requirement for sight picture is somewhat less, the bolt action volume of fire could go up to 20 rounds per minute. The shotgun, which looks so good in that film clip, all of a sudden doesn't look so good here. Its range is only 50 yards, and its volume of fire is actually quite low. The problem here is the reloading of the magazine. Though it is lightning fast while ammunition is in the weapon, once it is emptied, it then becomes deathly slow. The submachine gun seems to be a good blend. Its maximum range, though short, at least does not leave the shooter totally naked and helpless. As long as his movement is covered by bolt-action magazine rifles and machine guns, he can still move across open ground and protect himself at some reasonable range before he gets to the enemy trench. At the close range, his high volume of fire, which is all controllable fire, then becomes the overriding factor. I'd like to emphasize again that it is controllable fire. The submachine gun fires a pistol cartridge in a heavy shoulder-fired weapon, and the bursts can be directed without problem from the recoil. If the weapon was chambered for a more powerful cartridge, the recoil would drive the weapon up and away from the target and would limit its usefulness severely. The submachine gun became an essential element in the total German combined solution that we now know as German storm or German infiltration assault tactics. You'll study the results of the offensives using these tactics when you study World War I. Remember that the submachine gun, backed up with rifles and a new quasi-portable water-cooled machine gun, were the backbone of these tactics. The German platoon was organized around these weapons. One squad had submachine guns, with each submachine gunner having an ammunition bearer. Two squads had Mauser bolt-action rifles, and one squad had the 0815 Maxim machine gun. None of these weapons could have survived alone. However, when woven into the proper organization and with a tactical doctrine that intelligently took advantage of each weapon's characteristics, they performed well. Mm -hmm.